I'm usually loud enough. Oh, let's see. So, hello everyone. My name is Bjorn. I'm a programmer. Hello, Bjorn. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> I've been a programmer for many years. It's a struggle every day, but I get through it. Just believe in yourself and you can do it. So I'm going to talk to you guys about what is DevOps. Uh, you're going to have a lot of repetition now from what Serena's been saying, so you're going to have to live with that. <laughs> very thorough, very thank you for that. Uh, so why do I think I can talk about DevOps? So for the last couple of years, I've been working very heavily in a lot of places, helping people understand what DevOps is. I've been helping implement DevOps culture in Singapore government agencies, I've been in banks, I've been with a bunch of startups, I've been with a bunch of people. So that's why I think I, I can talk a bit about DevOps. So my background is that I am primarily a back-end developer doing a bunch of things, but I worked in a bunch of different theme teams, and because of that, I've become one of these known full stack developers, meaning that in my case, I know a lot about doing back end work, and I have a rough idea of how you do things in the front end, so I can muddle it through. <laughs> <laughs> so, what that means is also that uh, I have a pretty good idea of what it means that all of the other people in the stack that I'm working on is doing. Like, I don't fully understand it, but I've gotten a lot of empathy for what it is that it goes into. What does it mean when you're dealing with Influx or with React or whatever that is? Like, I don't understand. I don't have to, but I understand there's a lot of work to it. And empathy is key because DevOps, at the end of the day, is all about culture. It's a culture that everyone should be working together. And uh, the point there comes into that we're developers, we are operations people, sysadmins, scouring away, figuring out why the SCSI drivers aren't working on a Saturday morning because something went bananas. It happens. Business people figuring out that, yeah, the, the increase in taxes in, meant something. Now we have to change everything. New feature has to happen really fast. It just goes on. QAs, so on. Like, we all have to work together. But what does it really mean that we all work together and what are we trying to achieve by working together? Well, what we're trying to do is get our code into production. Because what's the point of writing code, building the software if we people aren't using it? We need to get people to use the stuff that we build. And preferably as quickly as possible. That's why we have uh, tooling to help us out with that and we should do it to as much quality as possible because What's the point of releasing bad software to people that want to use it? That's just going to lead to frustration. Frustration leads to people leaving, and terrible for customers to leave because I like their money. <laughs> <laughs> hey, end of the day, right? But so how do we go about actually achieving these things? Because what we want to do is that we want to have quality. How do we get quality? Well, you write some tests. TDD. I'm, I'm a big agile guy despite what it might look like. The <laughs> hey, it's okay, I'm me. Um, so practice TDD, I, that's my key thing I would recommend everyone to do. It's just gonna make your life so much easier, especially when you're trying to get, go up, as all of these agile practices really comes into play. And DevOps is a uh, culture of also taking care of this. It's all agile in the end. And, uh, the other things that comes into now we start talking a little bit more what people generally talk about when it comes to, de to DevOps, provisioning. So what does that mean? Well, it's pretty much things like you get your servers up, the things that you used to do once, the thing that you used to get written down that, yeah, 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 we got a server, someone took two weeks off and they installed it and now we have it working. Please don't mess with it too much. It's going to be fine. So create databases. Maybe you need to do some database migrations, get your schemas up to date, do some migra migrations for like actual data and so on. You know, all of that stuff. The, you also need to make sure that you have something you can actually run and you want to also have the ability to go back to it sometimes in the future. So if I do a deployment and my tests weren't perfect, they're probably not, I'm human after all, they're, they're never gonna be 100%. Tests are, always going to be about what you can cover as a developer at point in time when you're writing it. That's why we do pair programming as well because that will help us better see a different point of view. And uh, 
having deployable artifacts will help us get things out quicker and back again when they go wrong. And of course, automated deployments, because we can't get our stuff into production fast unless we know we can ha it can happen at the click of a button, or even better, automatically. And uh, the thing that you can notice about all of this is that this is all about what people do. Like, pretty much this is all about like, the things that we need to get done to actually make it happen. But how do we actually do that? And the way of that is it's tools, of course. It's always about tools in the end. Like, we ca talk about culture, but, uh, which is the important bit. It's about the outcomes, but we do need tools. So we have tools like Ansible, Chef Puppet, which is like the thing that you install some kind of agent or you log into a server, it will install this package, that package, configure Nginx, put Apache on hold, whatever it is. That's, what you have. That's a good tool to have in your belt if you're doing that. Maybe you need to create a EC2 instance or con 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 connect to the Google Cloud and you need to give them a server. Terraform, fantastic tool for provisioning infrastructure. Tell it that I want a server, it's going to be this big, it's going to be 10 of them, they're going to be named like this. So it works great. Together with Ansible, you can get that configured the way you need. It takes time, but that's pretty much what it is. A lot of people these days are using container orchestration, which is more like Kubernetes, like Nomad, or ECS from Amazon. Um, these tools are all about containers. And it's all about making sure that you can get your code, take that artifact, put it in a container, run it somewhere. Generally, when you have it up and running, it's a lot less work than doing something like ah, Ansible and so on. So I would, if, you, if you're starting out, look into that. Amazon, together with their Fargate, is really no frills way of going about it if you want to look into it. Then you want to probably look at cloud provider APIs. Maybe there isn't some particular tool that fits the bill exactly for you. Each organization is different. Maybe you have specific deployment scenarios you have to care about. Knowing that you can just connect to their APIs and do it yourself is very powerful and really empowering, which also comes into custom scripts. I personally do a ton of these. Um, at one of my previous gigs, I wrote something like 40,000 lines of bash. It, it, it was a particular deployment scenario involving 12 servers, three data centers, and a government. <laughs> I begged for Perl, <laughs> which for those who know. <laughs> so the question then also becomes, how do you know that you need a tool? Ah, well, so apparently I forgot to enable the thing that makes it only do one at a time. Uh, so yeah, so did it take a lot of effort, manual effort to do something? So. Yeah, so a lot of the ways people go about this is that, well, it's really complicated to get all this automated tooling. I spend a day doing it, but it only takes half an hour to do it manually, take some screenshots, it's all done, it's good. Yeah, but if it's runnable code, you know that if you run it again, you can see when it works. Documentation just stays there. And the, ten the tendency with documentation, especially with screenshots, is that it's taken with a version, that version was changed one and a half years ago, and no one has updated, nothing works anymore. And names have changed, everything. Runnable code is always a winner. Uh, code is documentation, as it were. Um, make sure everyone does things the same way. Like in my company, we have a deployment process that we want everyone to follow. Like, obviously, it happens through CI, but before we had CI up and going because I came in late, we had to do it from our laptops. And having that checklist of how to do all the steps, nah. I'd rather have a script. It can check all of those things. And it does it much better than I do because I get bored easily. So much, much better. And what do you do when, well, the sewage hits the air, what generator has to say? Do you take two weeks of downtown and your business stands still, or do you just spin it up again? Maybe it will take half a day. It's what it takes. At one of my previous gigs, one of the, we had that happen every week. We took down one of our environments, spun it up from scratch, saw that everything was still working. And sadly, almost every week something went wrong because we didn't think about the fact that we aren't always starting over from a good known state. We have to start from nothing. And it's really valuable to know that you can do that. And I will admit that right now, this will not work in my company, in my team, because I haven't spent the time fixing that. I will get there if I'm working on it. So you need tools. Like It's important. The tools are important. but at the end of the day, if you're talking DevOps, it's not about the tools. 
it's, it's about the people doing it. And it's also important to think that just because you're buying things, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the story behind it. And also just because a tool is big and fancy and because everyone is using Kubernetes doesn't mean that it's the best choice. Sometimes maybe the best tool is something you make yourself. It doesn't have to be that big. Maybe you figure out that, um, like for instance, I have a service in my company that figures out what is the next, what's the next version I should use for the thing that I just built. We have 20 odd services and when they get a version number. Yes, I could build something, I can put something on Flask or on Sinatra, I can get it up and running. Also using Amazon, they have something called DynamoDB. And if I use the Amazon CLI, I can just ask them to give me a number and it does. It works great, it took 10 minutes. Best spend time ever, it's still running. So to give an example of a deployment scenario when you have this kind of automation, which I said, running on CI, CD, it's because it all comes down there. It's the place where a lot of these things happen at the end of the day because you don't want it to happen on your machine. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that you start there. So the way my deployment process starts with I run all of my tests to make sure that everything is green. I don't want to make sure I push something that's wrong. And the reason I have this in a script is because we have multiple code bases using many different things, different versions of Python, lots of setup. It's a lot easier if I just don't have to care about exactly how that happened. Let's, annoy, let's avoid this checklist. Then I want to deploy this, this particular thing onto staging. I, don't, I just want a new version. I want you to build this thing for me since I know that my tests are green. And please do that. But what goes into that? So you build a deploy package that goes into uh, my artifact repository. And I can then pick it up later and I can roll it back. Uh, queries that central database for a number to use so that we know that we can refer to it later. So when we say that deploy 27 failed, we know that it's deploy 27 everywhere. If I deploy build 27 in staging and I say that I want build 27 in production, it's the same package. I know it, it's fine. I don't have to worry about drift. And especially important that hopefully you also have all of your dependencies in your package so you don't get stung, stung by that because that can be annoying. And uh, yeah, upload package repository for archiving, deploy it, notify monitoring environment so we know that there has been a deploy. If we start seeing anything that's a little bit odd, maybe we can tie it back to that we deployed something. Because as I said, tests are still at the end of the day written by humans. We're going to miss things. We don't think about everything. It's what it is. So to recap, what I have talked about is so. DevOps is a culture about collaborating with other stakeholders. Who they are depends on where you are and what you're doing. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it, it's your, your situation that matters. Um, it's about getting a code running as fast as possible with as high, high a quality as possible somewhere so people can use it. You want to keep that cycle as quick as possible. That's what you really want. So what DevOps is not is tools. Like, you don't buy DevOps. <laughs> <laughs> I don't at all, all have strong opinions about this. The closest thing you come to buying DevOps is the help of getting it set up by a good company like Mavericks. But that's it. And DevOps is not a person. It's something that you as a team do. Like you don't want to be in a situation where there's one person that knows what's going on. This is an effort that everyone should be involved in. Everyone should feel responsible for their build. If it goes red, you go in and fix it. If, if, if nothing is happening, you have to take up as a team to work on it. So the idea of hiring a DevOps engineer to do DevOps, it's like having a collaboration person that does all the collaboration for the entire team. <laughs> it's a ridiculous notion. And uh, as a final point on tooling is that saying that you're doing DevOps because you bought some tool, it's like saying that you're a developer because you use Vim. <laughs> I mean, first off, no, it's Emacs. <laughs> Fired. <laughs> Secondly, it's, it's all about the outcomes. It doesn't matter if you it doesn't matter where the code comes from as long as it works. And that's what we all should care about. And remember that, 
when it comes to getting things out, you should know where you're coming from. You should make sure that you have your fundamentals right. You work on your tests, you work on your design patterns, you work on how things fit together, and it's work on how it works with the product, because delivering shit faster just gets it messy. And uh, any questions? Any questions for... Well, you can take questions later. Yeah. So I just couldn't figure out how to, to segue into this, but I really want to share this GIF, so here goes. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.